Selena for a very generous uh, introduction. I am so much excited. Um, I've been um, along with my team planning for the conference for a really long time. And today we are radiating this conference from uh, the boardroom of Rifa International University, Pakistan. <laughs> Pakistan is one of the countries highly vulnerable to climate change. The World Air Quality Report 2021 has ranked Pakistan among the most polluted country in the world. In recent years, Pakistan has faced floods, droughts, heat waves that have killed thousands of people, destroyed livestock and infrastructure. There is a speculation of Pakistan's future environmental catastrophes if the global warming scale remains the same. In recent years, Pakistan has faced flood. There is a speculation of Pakistan's future environmental catastrophes if the global warming scale remains the same. Several measures can be taken to control global warming, among them, is helping people become environmentally knowledgeable and responsive. This goal might be achieved by creating an eco-linguistics approach that utilizes people's first language to better understand environmental situations. Pakistan is a country where over 74 languages are spoken across its regions. These languages have unique structures and cultural approaches that serves to promote and maintain their local environments. However, the environmentally related texts currently used to appeal to people to protect the natural environment are primarily in English and Urdu, which may result in large portion of Pakistan population who may miss or misunderstand the messages conveyed. For example, certain English words, the greenhouse uh, effect and greenhouse gases used to communicate about global warming are usually perceived by the Pakistani multilingual speakers as a way to promote green environment. The Urdu language translates the metaphor greenhouse effect as subs makani asar that is connotated with migration and house with green effect. It is surprising to note that linguistic structures used to report global warming supposedly yeah. signify <laughs> the climate crisis as a future problem and mass human agency. Even nature and objects are explicitly declared responsible for disturbing ecosystem. The Indus, for example, the Indus uh, River Dolphin is affected by pollution in the river. So the um, pollution is made responsible for killing of Indus River Dolphin instead of human being. There are abstraction realized linguistically that minus the individuals responsible for destroying the environment. Language and communication are magical abilities that we all humans have. They are powerful forces that shape our opinions, attitude, and ultimately behavior. Sepper, one of the early exponents of eco-linguistics, points out that there is the vocabulary of a language that primarily reflect its speaker's physical, social environment. Thus, the language we speak enables us to express our responses to world climate crisis. As we have, as this has been endorsed by Michael Halliday long time ago, that pollution is not only the problem of environmentalists, but it, but also for applied linguistic community to explore how human actions manifested through language have caused unprecedented change in the ecosystem. Our first international e-conference on ecolinguistics and ecological narratives highlights the importance of local languages. 
that may play an essential role in engaging citizens in greater understanding of the world environmental crisis and providing an ecolinguistic solution. The conference aims to be a part of a critical language awareness that suggests ecolinguistic planning to integrate and potentially expose uses of languages and linguistic forms which may contribute to ecological well being. I'm indebted to uh, Mr. Hassan Mohammed Khan, Chancellor, uh, Rifa International University, Dr. Uh, Anis Ahmed, Vice Chancellor of Rifa International University, uh, Dr. Atiku Zafar Khan, Dean Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanity, for their permission and generous support sport to organize the conference at the Department of English, Linguistics, and Literature, Islamabad. This conference was not possible without the insistent assistance of Mr. Hamid, oh, lecturer, thank you. Department of English. I would like to thank my faculty members, Ms. Tehreen Wali, for coordinating with various departments at RIFA during the organization of the conference. I really appreciate the help and assistance of my three brilliant students, Ms. Um, Subaina Malak, Ms. Risa Khatak, Ms. Ikra Javed. I'm also grateful to the conference moderators and chairs for their expert assistance in making talks interactive for registered participants. I had a tremendous support of the abstract review committee to shortlist the relevant and applicable presentations. The abstracts we received were from scholars of diverse fields and regions who were interested in saving the natural environment. I am thankful to all the national and international scholars for their interest in the conference. However, I would like to mention five names, Dr. George Jacob, Dr. Hildo Hanario Do Cotto, Dr. Aaron Stebe, Dr. Peter Mokwane, Dr. Meng Hong Chow, who made the real difference in this conference. I would like to thank the technical team, marketing department for their sincere support throughout the conference. I'm extremely grateful to my colleagues, uh, Ms. Nayab Wakas Khan, uh, Ms. Ms. Sayyida Zahada Rizavi, uh, Ms. Sadaf Iftahar, Ms. Uh, Zainab Askar, and Mr. Misam Alam for their initial support to set the base for this conference while I was serving my previous organization. There are over 570 registered participants from 17 countries. I'm sure they will engage us with their critical questions on this critical issue. Thank you and have a wonderful time at our two days conference. Thank you very much, Dr. Shaban, for highlighting the importance of our dialogue on our conference topic. Ladies and gentlemen, I now request our worthy conference patron and Vice Chancellor Rifa International University, Professor Dr. Anis Ahmed, for his keynote address. Dr. Anis, a social scientist of international repute and educationist of distinction, is the founding Vice Chancellor of the university. He carries a PhD from the Temple University, Pennsylvania, USA. He has held new, numerous academic leadership positions, both nationally and internationally. Most recently, he has been appoint, appointed Chairman National Rahmatullah Alameen Authority on pro bono. Professor Dr. Anis Ahmed for his keynote address. Sir. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam at Khatam Khandiwa. Uh, respectable head of department, Dr. Shaban, uh, Dr. Samina, uh, faculty members, and particularly the large number of distinguished participants in this uh, uh, conference. I welcome all of you and hope that uh, this conference will open new areas of critical thinking and particularly help us in making our share in saving universe from catastrophe. 
every single individual has a capacity to do one's best in trying to avoid those catastrophes by which globally we have devastations. I'm very glad to understand, to, to know that you have selected a topic which is uh, uh, dealing with ecology. Uh, and as uh, in the beginning, uh, you selected some portions of the Quran where ecological, not only ecological, but socio-ecological aspects uh, have been synergized in a divine language. Human languages, as very well said by the Dr. Shaban, uh, do have uh, imprint of nature, of e ecological aspects, but in the Quran you find a, at a universal level, not local level, uh, a merging together of all those aspects which are part of actual hu human living. It's not uh, a piece of uh, imagination, but it's a divine revelation that uh, reminds mm -hmm. us of our universe around us, our own existence, the uh, world of uh, um, oceans. Uh, it, it talks about all those aspects which make sense in human existence in this universe. And therefore, from ecological viewpoint, it tells us that you have to maintain and create a balance. And that balance means conservation of resources. That balance means taking care of not only yourself, but also taking care of mankind. It encourages individuals to come forward and play a creative role but not at the cost of raping universe. It wants development in economy, but not at the cost of loss of nations and uh, emergence of poverty globally. It wants us to uh, develop a society where people respect human dignity and honor. In all that, the central point is everything has to be done in a moderate and balanced manner. It's very interesting that even uh, some of the sayings of the prophet uh, are full of wisdom with reference to this theme. A hadith tells us that even if you want to make your evolution at the bank of a river, then don't wash more than three times. And that reminds me of people who when they uh, make early morning wash up, they take a shower, they wash their face, they leave the tap open and let water flow. And in taking a shower, they stay there for not a few minutes, but quite a number of minutes. The fact of the matter is a person can take a shower in less than five minutes. But if you want to enjoy just uh, warm water in winter and cold water in summer and stay there for 20 minutes, then you are depriving millions of people of a single sip, which could have saved their life. Therefore, uh, the Quran and prophetic Sunnah is full of those references where the importance of human life importance of uh, green life, importance of uh, all those aspects which are needed for humanity to progress. Uh, in one of my papers published quite some time back, I have referred to a, a good number of uh, references and data is provided on how in United States of America, for example, one day newspaper causes about uh, 5,000 trees to be cut and used. If that is going on for every weekend, then you can imagine our claims of ecological concern, how true they are. I think it's not a matter of just uh, a few nations, but it's a global issue. And our literature 
whether it's English or Urdu or Arabic, all of them have to address these issues. Poetry particularly is uh, full of uh, uh, references to ecological aspects. And in, in Urdu language particularly, I know uh, there are thousands of uh, couplets where you find that uh, a poet has taken help from uh, flowers, from trees, from grass, from all those aspects around nature, and, and then uh, bring it down as a source of inspiration. Uh, I'm glad that uh, we are now addressing this issue from an academic viewpoint and not only uh, our environmental issues, but I think we should also address social issues in, in Pakistan and global social issues where we need to uh, talk about uh, uh, human rights of people, human rights of children, human rights of women, human rights of uh, uh, those who are poor and deprived and so on and so forth. And all those aspects have direct relevance with language and literature. Some of the best uh, works of literature uh, relate with uh, actual situations people have faced, crisis situations, and sometimes situations which are uh, pleasant and uh, rewarding for them. So I hope that our department, which has made a very healthy and positive step towards uh, 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 the positive thinking and critical thinking by this conference, will inshallah explore more areas and our faculty members and uh, students will join in this uh, uphill task of changing the mindset of people, making them more conscious and aware of their social responsibility, ecological responsibility, human responsibility. I'm also uh, thankful to our overseas uh, uh, participants, faculty members from academia, as well as those who have joined as participants. And I hope this will not be the first and last, but it will be the beginning of a series of conferences on ecology, on social issues, on literary issues, and not only just native languages, but even languages which have universal applicability. So uh, I again thank the department, uh, Dr. Shaban, Dr. Samina, Dr. Our uh, uh, Dean, Dr. Atiq, and faculty members. And I hope that our faculty members and students will learn from this experience and with the uh, uh, collaboration at global level, we'll be able to play our role in the overall sustainability of mankind and preservation of nature as much as possible. May Allah bless you all. I thank you again for giving me time to share with you my ideas. May Allah bless you all. Thank you very much, sir. We are grateful for your motivation, participation and presence. Thank you, sir. Dear audience, the environment being everything that surrounds us is where peace dwells. Reciprocating with humans, animals, all creatures, great and small, plants, forests, and surrounding infrastructure. Such is the conviction expressed by our first keynote speaker, Dr. Peter Makwania from Zimbabwe Open University. He is a researcher and publisher in climate change issues, strengths in critical discourse analysis, media studies, corpus linguistics, and environment communication. His topic today is, let nature speak, exploring the language of the environment as a laboratory for learning. Our first keynote speaker, Dr. Peter Makwania. Over to you, sir. Welcome, sir. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, sir, we can hear you. Can you see my slide? Um, it's uh, you yourself that we can see. Uh, if you share your presentation, maybe we'll be able to see that as well.
Can you see it now? No, mm -hmm. still cannot see, unfortunately. Do we have uh, his presentation? If we do, we can play it or Please share your screen, sir. I think uh, he's lost. Dr. Makwania, if you think you want to send us your presentation so that we play it for you and maybe we invite our next speaker for the time being. Right. Uh, let, me send it, um, uh, let me send it to you so that you can share it from there. Okay. Okay. Please send it to us and then we move on with our proceedings and invite the second speaker. In the meantime, we'll receive your presentation and we'll play it. Is that okay? Yes, let me send it. If we move on. Uh... Can you see it now? Uh, no, I'm sorry. We still can't see it. Please share your uh, screen with the green button. If you press the green button, share screen, maybe. Uh, I think, Jim, should, should we, okay. Um, Dr. Makwania will come back to you after, uh, in the meantime, please send your presentation to us. We'll handle it from here. And I Thank move you. on to our next uh, speaker. In fact, um, dear audience, it is my pleasure to announce our next keynote speaker, Dr. George Jacobs, University of Santo Tomas, Manila, Philippines. Dr. Jacobs completed his doctorate from University of Hawaii his main areas of research and scholarship are teaching methods, especially student-centered approaches, corporate learning, multiple intelligence, and extensive reading. With enthusiasm, he propagates environmental education and human-animal studies. He is a renowned vegan activist. The topic of his keynote address is Roles of Language in Achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Dr. George Jacobs, over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I think everyone can see my slides, yes? Yes, sure. Okay, thank you. Welcome, Hello. sir. Yes. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Presentation you present Karen, must hear techniques that near Okiakia Chis and Dalte, especially Yeju internationally. So I want to thank everyone, everyone in the noble field of language education, and especially the organizers of this, con this conference. Dr. Shaban and his team have been working very hard. 
And I want to thank all of you who are attending the conference. As the chair said, my name is George Jacobs. I teach many places. And I teach, last night I was teaching in Manila, but I also teach for University of Malaya in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Here's my email address. I welcome you to stay in touch, to work together as the opening speaker said, we, the environment is a very big problem. It's a very important problem. We all need to work together to help solve this problem. Also, I have a website with many of my past papers. So let me give a little background on the Sustainable Development Goals. They seek a comfortable life for all while protecting the environment for future generations. So that's why it's development. We want everyone to have a good life, but it's got to be sustainable. And back in 2000, the United Nations formulated the Millennium Development Goals and progress was made. Then in 2016, the United Nations launched the Sustainable Development Goals and these will continue to be publicized and work toward till 2030. And here they are. I think many or even all of you are very familiar with these 17 goals. And a famous language educator, Alan Maley, who's worked many places in Asia as well as in other countries, recently published a book with the British Council. It's a free online book with lesson plans for all of the different sustainable development goals. So there's the link and you can get a electronic copy of the book free. And at the beginning of that book by Alan Maley, there's a poem that he wrote. And it, I, I really like this poem. It really struck me, the ending especially. So this is a poem for two voices. The person's voice in the bold font is a member of the public and the person's voice in the regular font is a teacher. So let me read it to you, please. What do you do? I'm a teacher. What do you teach? People. What do you teach them? English. Oh, you mean grammar, verbs, nouns, pronunciation, conjugation, articles and particles, negatives and interrogatives. That too. What do you mean that too? Well, I also try to teach them how to think and feel, show them inspiration, aspiration, cooperation, participation, consolation, innovation. <laughs> Think about globalization, exploitation, confrontation, incarceration, discrimination, degradation, subjugation, how inequality becomes poverty, how intolerance brings violence, how need is denied by greed, how isms become prisons, how thinking and feeling can bring healing. Well, I don't know about that. Maybe you should stick to language. Forget about anguish. You can't change the world. But if I did that, I'd be a cheater, not a teacher. So I'm curious about your thoughts. Do you agree with the final line of the poem? But if I did that, in other words, I just stuck to teaching English. I'd be a cheater, not a teacher. In other words, teachers have an obligation to teach more than language, mathematics, 
or science or whatever their subject is, are we also obligated to teach at a level appropriate to our students how to think and feel, show them inspiration, aspiration, cooperation, participation, consolation, innovation. So maybe you could use the chat box. I just uh, give everyone a minute or two. Go ahead and put your thoughts. What do you think about the final line of the poem? Go ahead, please. We've already got one person. So one person says that the Alan Maley poem is really insightful. I, I agree. Anyone else? Ah, wow, a lot of people. Okay, great. Yeah, so of course that's not easy to do. And uh, I'm gonna give three ideas for how we can move toward that. But first I wanna mention a milestone in what's called eco-linguistics, combining concern for the environment with our knowledge of language. A very famous linguist, Michael Halliday, gave a talk at the 10th Association, International Association for Applied Linguistics Conference in 1990. And he said, language does not passively reflect reality. Language actively creates reality. Our reality is not something ready-made and waiting to be meant. It has to be actively construed and language evolved in the process of and as the agency of its construal. So we really need to think about what we say, what we write, what the videos we make, et cetera. And three ways that language impacts the sustainable development goals. Growthism versus less is more. Native speakerism versus use of native languages. And the relative pronoun who with non-human animals. So let's start with this growthism. Which is better, more or less, bigger or smaller, higher or lower? faster, slower, new or old, growth or contraction? Well, most people would say the column on the left, those are the things that we want. But maybe those are the things that are leading us to environmental catastrophe. So people who promote less is more, we believe that society can achieve greater happiness by simplifying desires. I'm not talking about very poor people. I'm talking about people in the middle class, the upper class. If we simplify our desires rather than trying to satisfy all of them. So less consumption, like our opening speaker said, not taking 20 minute showers can lead to greater well-being. And being for less is more doesn't mean no technology. In fact, technology can help us achieve our goal of happiness with less. And there's many types of friendly technology, alternative energy, alternative protein, in other words, growing meat without animals, hydrogen powered airplanes, etc. Uh, there's the famous quote that I'm sure you've all heard from Gandhi. There is enough for everyone's need, but not enough for everyone's greed. 
or Greta Thunberg, the environmental activist said, we are in the beginning of mass extinction, mass extinction of animal and plant species. And what she said to world leaders in the United, at the United Nations, and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. Okay, moving on to a second topic, native speakerism versus native languages. Currently, when we talk about world languages, we're talking mostly about English. And even within English, you've got to speak one of two varieties, either British or US English. And everybody needs to adapt their pronunciation, grammar, vocabulary, culture, to those two varieties, else you don't get respect. You're seen as, uh, you're not very smart. Look at your, your English is so bad, but their English isn't bad. It's just not one of the two main varieties because we're assessed based on how we do with those two standards. And native languages are often banned from the classroom. Dr. Shaban mentioned, I think, 74 different languages in Pakistan. And we have these various varieties all over the world. In English, we have different languages. Languages we also have in Singapore, we have Singlish. But the problem with native speakerism for English is that it's saying Traditional cultures are inferior. We need modern culture. We need growthism. But the answer is a trend called translanguaging, where we value students' traditional languages and cultures. And then the thir a third way that language and the sustainable development goals link is just for example, the using the pronoun who, the relative pronoun who, with non-human animals. Very often we see non-human animals as objects, not thinking, feeling beings. Language has a role, as Halliday said. A very famous primatologist, Jane Goodall, wrote her first paper on chimpanzees in the 1960s. She gave chimps names, not numbers. She used the relative pronoun who, not that or what. For example, she said the chimpanzee who I saw is named David Graybeard. Now, believe it or not, more than 50 years later, Dr. Goodall and others, including Dr. Chow, who's going to be speaking later, and myself are still advocating for that change. We're, for example, we're trying to get the American Psychological Association's publication manual and the Associated Press's style guide to change. Our hope is that by using who, we show more respect and concern for animals. Thereby, we will protect the environment in which they and we live. Of course, showing respect for other animals does not mean believing they're the same as us. All the species are different. So to conclude, language plays a crucial role as we attempt to make progress toward the sustainable development goals. This paper offered three examples. To achieve the SDDs, SDGs, we need to move away from the language of growthism. Second, we need to value all languages and all language users. This means valuing all people's contributions to the SDGs. Third, we need to show respect and concern for non-human animals by considering the relative pronoun who when referring to them and by treating them better via attainment of the SDGs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Jacobs. Uh, in fact, for giving us an insight into language teaching at all levels, schools, colleges, and universities. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Dear audience, uh, hoping that our 
matters are settled with uh, the presentation of Dr. Makwania. So once again, I'm introducing him. Uh, it is a very, very enriched statement with which I begin. And he says that the environment being everything that surrounds us is where peace dwells, reciprocating with humans, animals, all creatures, great and small, plants, forests, and surrounding infrastructure. So such is the conviction expressed by uh, our keynote speaker, Dr. Peter Makwania from Zimbabwe Open University. He is a researcher and publisher in climate change issues, strengths in critical discourse analysis, media studies, corpus linguistics, and environment communication. His topic today is Let Nature Speak, exploring the language of the environment as a laboratory for learning. Over to, over to you, uh, Dr. Peter Makwania. Yeah, I hope it is connected. Yeah, okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, can you move the slide, please? Thank you. Right, uh, sorry for the mishap that she happened in the beginning. Uh, let's, uh, my topic uh, read as, has been expressed by the coordinator. Uh, our dearest wish is that he, the environment, as it has been seen as a passive, should be able to communicate. But unfortunately, it doesn't communicate in the manner that we expect it to, it doesn't communicate in the manner that we see, but its kind of interaction should be in, uh, ingrained in us as human beings, as individuals, so that as we visualize it, uh, we will know exactly that uh, the environment is communicating or should communicate. But it also starts with our perceptions, our public perceptions uh, in as far as the natural environment are, how is, do we as individual visualize the natural environment? Uh, do, we, do we place it side by side with us uh, as reciprocal in nature or are we driven by eco freak tendencies in order to destabilize the environment? But in as far as all this uh, is concerned, our focus here should be the learner. How best can we convince the learner, the learners and the young that nature is learning center of choice? We have got a wide range of choices in life, but Amongst all those choices, we do not include the environment. So let us learn to place the environment at the heart of sustainable development. Let us learn to place the environment at the heart of our learning practices. Uh, nature is equivalent, as, the, as it defined there, to the natural world, physical or ma material world, that is the phenomena of the physical world and also in general. So we are saying it's an assortment of co-relating issues, interacting uh, uh, issues uh, that we see with the naked eye and those that we cannot see with the naked eye. And also as defined by Douglas, uh, nature as the natural environment can also be in the form of the wilderness wild animals, forest rocks, or the physical landscape. But it is also important to see how these interact in their own way uh, uh, to form what we call a bubble of nature. What do we get from nature? It provides ecosystemic services, a wide range, a variety of benefits provided by the natural environment uh, to us human beings, these, we sometimes get them through 
unnecessary exploitations. Sometimes we get them through uh, forest ecosystems, grasslands, aquatic uh, ecosystems, among others. Next slide. Now, how does nature speak and how does it facilitate learning? Nature presents learners with sound scientific information for decision making, choices and problem skills. That is according to Jan's 2008, we are saying, it's not just the natural environment as we visualize it. It is an assessment of a wide range of interaction or interacting components that help it to tick, that also help us as individual to find the information that we want to solve our everyday problems, to enhance our learning, to increase our knowledge, information, and communication. So to the young people, I say, let us enjoy playing in the physical environment, not in isolation, but as we learn, in order to understand its natural and aesthetic value, the beauty that it projects from afar should not be lost uh, on the way. We need to be part and parcel of the beauty by conserving and presenting, uh, preserving it, by avoiding issues like deforestations, degradations, and pollution. We must get guard against greenhouse gases that can tarnish the beauty and the aesthetic value of nature so that we can preserve and conserve our forest or our natural environment for the future generations to come. Nature plays a key role in solving many sustainable development challenges, including stewardship and climate change. As human beings, we are not just guardians of nature, but we are stewards. We have a responsibility. We are accountable in the manner in which we handle our natural environment. What do we mean? Let us raise awareness among learners on communication diversity that we can benefit from the natural environment so that we fill in information gaps that are provided by the traditional uh, and the rudimentary uh, already existing channels of communication. By investing in nature-based communication, learners benefit from the science. The science, the scientific environment is not only in the classroom. The scientific environment is in the environment where nature belongs. We can also treat the scientific environment in the absence of SDGs, as uh, once highlighted by the previous speaker, SDGs are very important in this regard. Uh, these are quality education. Quality education is goal number four. Quality education is not education in isolation. Quality education empowers learners with problem solving skills for everyday uh, transactions. But this quality education does not exist in isolation because for in, uh, sustainable development goals to work, they need to be integrated. The, 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 the learner needs to be uh, well-fed and in good health, also not, not uh, leaving other gender, uh, not leaving the gender behind. We need to focus on gender. Issues of clean water and sanitation are also ingrained in the environment not forgetting goal number 13, which is topical these days, it is climate action. So in as much as we would want to preserve nature, let us not forget the sustainable development goals. The young generation needs to be empowered as academics will champion the sustainable future and sustainable management of nature as one of the world's precious natural environment. 
we get water, a precious component indeed. We get food, we get minerals. So we need to preserve as we explore the minerals, let us leave the environment intact. Nature is viewed as supreme farmer or a gardener in the study of how you will provide, it provides us with one thing we need for sound and reliable di uh, direction without the most important thing we need, which is livelihood. We get from the environment, the livelihoods that uh, makes us going, uh, help us to fight adaptation. These are important in their own regards. With the climate change raging, if we do not adapt, we will die. So it is in our best interest and in everyone that we look at the natural environment and create a relationship with it through the language we use, not that language that uh, promotes us to uh, exploit the environment, but the, the language, linguistic tools that make us have relationship with nature and be able to tell our story. Next. Next slide. As we talk about this, let us look at what drives our research, what drives this topic. It is in, uh, premised in uh, qualitative design, describing and interpreting phenomena. We must be able to describe our natural environment. We must be able to explain several benefits or core benefits that we get from the natural environment. But as we do so, we are not doing that in isolation. There are approaches that are context specific in that regard. Ecological discourse analysis, multimodal learning, uh, interactive learning is part of the eco-linguistic perspective of examining nature. We need to find out to, or to at least what is backgrounded by using ecological discourse analysis, which recognizes three ecosystems of language, namely the natural, the mental, and the social ecosystem. We are saying, let there be a relationship between human beings and the natural environment. Let be the relationship between the environment with our mental processes, the manner and the ways in which we think should not be influenced by greed. The manner by which we think should not be influencing, influenced by eco-freak tendencies, by uh, degradation tendencies, deforestation tendencies. It must also be found within the social ecological ecosystems of the language we use, the way in which we communicate. That should be taught to our learners as they grow as they are young, they grow using relevant linguistic tools in order to be able to interact with the environment in which they live. So in terms of disco, uh, ecological discourse analysis, it prefers to focus on the ecological view of the world. What informs our lenses, our perspectives, our perceptions? They must be informed by the manner in which we view the environment in good faith. Nature needs to be visualized in terms of harmony. As we look outside and in the environment around us, we need to be guided by peace. We need to be guided 
by harmony. We need to be guided by togetherness. In as much as the complementary nature of the environment in terms of how we relate to it as individuals. EDA evaluates the nature in the context which it emerges. That's why I was saying in the beginning, we don't have to analyze or deal with environmental issues in isolation. We need to deal with environmental issues, nature in the context of sustainable development goals, in the context of sustainable development, in the context of environmental uh, environmental sustainability for the sustainable environment that we all want. EDA places life on earth as it is part of ecology. Yes, we don't live in isolation. We live side by side by the environment. So life on earth is the center, at the center of uh, ecological distribution, which is part of our biology and science of life. This is very critical. It is very important because as learners would you think that biology or the science of life is only in the classroom, but it's out there in the environment where larger components interact amongst themselves uh, within each other. By so doing, that is why nature should not be viewed in isolation but as a laboratory with regards to learning processes. Next slide. Next. Then comes multimodal interactive learning, where nature is viewed as a, formal, a form of multimodal learning environment. Uh, multimodal can be viewed as a learning environment that uses two different modes of more that represent uh, knowledge which is verbal and non-verbal. As we get into the environment, we don't always communicate verbally. Uh, verbal communication is complemented by non-verbal communication cues that we see as objects, that we see as visuals, uh, and many others. Learners are presented with verbal representation of content and correspond the visual content, in this case, in the natural environment, so that communication is not only realized, but it is enhanced. In a multimodal setup, learners understand, understanding can be enhanced by the addition of non-verbal knowledge uh, representations to verbal explanations to make communication beneficial. Next. Next slide, multimodal, multimodal learning continued. Uh, what happens depends on the actions of the learner during the learning process. As we send the learners into the environment, we want them to be guided by what happens there. We want them to be actively involved we want them to take photographs. We want them to uh, record themselves. We want them to take videos in order to tell their own stories. So multimodal learning helps to reduce environmental damaging practices and enhance the relationship between human beings and nature, according to the eco-linguistics eco approach. Next slide. Next. On the use of metaphors and visual, the aim is to help reduce a carbon footprints of humans on the environment. Our dearest wish in as far as multimodal learning uh, using more metaphors is concerned is to have the metaphors have an impact on our behavioral at practices, on our attitudes, so that we change the way we, uh, we relate to the environment. Learners can also exploit language games to deal with the management crisis, trying to 
preserve the natural image of the environment. Let the learners play. Let the learners enjoy nature. Let the learners enjoy the environment so that they also benefit from its diversity. There's also the uh, aspect of communicative impact of uh, the pre pre present outdoors. It doesn't mean that the present outdoors should be the natural environment only. We, we have got the outdoors where we have got infrastructure. This infrastructure should also help to consolidate our views on nature. And also that's when we foreground our anthropogenic world which is key, our behaviors, our human activities must be regulated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Makwania. I think you have given a lot of material to the young people all over the world to think about the topic. And uh, it is really raising awareness for mother nature and your sensitivity for it. So thank you very much. We will be having, ex ex we are expecting many questions from our young people as well. And uh, we'll bring that to the question answer sessions. Ladies and gentlemen, our next keynote speaker is Dr. Rebecca Kanek Fox. Dr. Rebecca is Professor of Education and Director Division of the Advanced Professional Teacher Development and International Education in the College of Education and Human Development at George Mason University, Fairfax, Virginia. She's also faculty in the PhD in education specializations in teaching and teacher education, international education and the advanced studies in teaching and learning program. Her topic today is based on a joint research with Dr. Mohammad Shaban Rafi, focal person conference and chairperson, English department, Rifa International University, Islamabad. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Fox for her keynote address has this topic. Ecological worldviews of multilingual Pakistani speakers, implications for ecolinguistic planning. Over to you, ma'am, Dr. Rebecca. Thank you so very much. I would like to um, share my screen with you. So if you would allow me just a moment to do a quick transition, I'll also say hello to everyone and tell you how pleased I am to be able to be here to share some of the work that Dr. Shaban and I have been doing over time. And we are, it, it is just so nice to follow Dr. Peter Makwanya because we all are standing for the same message and thinking about how do we um, all come to meet this challenge that we're facing as a world. So I am going to stop speaking for one moment while I do this transition and I will be right with you. I'm wondering if you see my screen. Are you able to um, see my screen at yes, this point? Yes, ma'am, we do. All right. Let's see. It's being a little bit slow. That should be better, yes? All right. So Dr. Shaban and I have been on a research quest and the title of our, of our topic today, which I am so honored to present and share with all of you, just a quick view is entitled Ecological Worldviews of Multilingual Pakistani Speakers and as a part of that, implications for ecolinguistic planning. See if I can get this to advance. There we go. So the background of our study, of course, we are in Pakistan. We know that Pakistan, like so many countries of the world, is one of the countries highly vulnerable to climate change. And this is something we are seeing around the world. And if this remains, this global warming and other climate changes are going to remain, are remaining the same, 
same as they are now. There is just strong speculation for ongoing environmental catastrophes. So we absolutely, as a field, as a collective, must start addressing the topic of global warming and the other accompanying global um, needs. So we have, in part of our research, Dr. Siobhan and I have, have really noted that most of the documents and communication are largely in English and Urdu. And Dr. Shaban and I both being in linguistics and in working with languages, naturally our thoughts in addition to thinking about this personal relationship and personal responsibility that we must all have to the environment, also went to that feeling place, that place of how do we come to understand nature? How do we come to understand the disasters that are facing us? And then how do we come to act on those concerns as individuals, as regional collectives, and as countries of the world. And so we really want to focus on, as this you'll see with this study, can we have to hold environmental communications to not only the two official languages in Pakistan, but to spread that out across the 74 other regional languages and dialects. So we've taken a combination of an eco-linguistic approach to looking at the data, and we've also applied a critical lens. And so of course, our field of ecolinguistics does provide a, a paradigm for reviewing individuals' linguistic choices to help them look at things to verbalize ideas and understandings about the nature in which they live and to interpret those, those messages. There has been some recent research that points out that the strength of using this eco-linguistic approach to language lies in its ability to incorporate culture and ecological parameters as considerations. And as, as Dr. Mawanya just said, the importance of addressing the context of a situation helps to achieve development goals. So, I, we hope that you will find our approach to be in concert with the thinking of our other esteemed presenters today. Critical perspectives from a linguistic point of view, as well as from a pedagogical one, add an important dimension for us in the world today, because that dimension elevates voice from voices who are not normally heard. There are probably many assumptions that might be made about communicating in a majority language, but that may not always, as we would say in the United States, hit a home run. That may not really get to the core of understanding all the way to the personal level. Dr. Mawanya talked about um, ecosystems being natural and personal and local. And if we are going to get to that personal and local space, we have to develop the means and the pathways to be able to do that. So critical perspectives incorporates those notions. And it also helps us to look at some ideas that Language in post-colonial settings, as well as linguistic imperialism, just the assumption that communicating in major languages is going to reach everyone, may not be what we think. So part of this conversation may be for us to take a step back and take that critical lens and look at 
the languages, languages with distinct structures, languages, regional languages that convey and support the diversity of custom and thought in multiple ways. And this is not only true in Pakistan, but it is, is true in many places of the world. So part of our questions as we connect with ecological critical lenses might be what are the perspectives from across the region? How are the voices telling us what is understood and what isn't understood? Who's at the table to find those communicative solutions? We had two specific research questions in addition to using our critical lens that helped to guide our investigation. So here are our two research questions. In what ways do the five major languages spoken in Pakistan exhibit linguistic resources that might help their speakers understand codes and forms about ecological problems. So we chose five languages because we had easy access to those. That does not mean that we are not concerned with the remaining 60 some languages, but it does mean that from a research perspective, this allowed us a doorway into some deeper thinking about communication and about perceptions and, and verbalization of ideas in the ecological domain. Our second question was, what are some changes that the five major Pakistani languages might employ in order to um, inform a greater biocentric worldview to touch people leaving, living in all regions of the country to, um, that could lead to and promote greater eco-solidarity in the country. So we used a qualitative research design. We also used a critical discourse analysis approach to understand not only the responses, but to delve below the surface and look at those responses. So we had a total of 25 university students in clusters of five speakers of the five languages, Balochi, Balti, Pashto, Punjabi, and Sinti. And these speakers of languages are all in linguistics at the university level. They're undergraduates. We had five major, or I'm sorry, three primary data sources. We had a perceptions essay that called on them to talk about the environment, to talk about their beliefs about the environment. We had a survey questionnaire, and there was also a word list that called on students to look at their, um, their home language, their mother tongue vis-a-vis -vis Urdu or English, and to see if the similar or the same words existed or how terminology was handled. In our qualitative analysis, we did um, a detailed look and um, looked for emergent themes and some general trends while we also delved below the surface. Given the time frame of our um, time together this morning, I, I only have a very few examples for you, but I think you will get the idea of some of the challenges that we um, that we under that we upturned. So just for a brief and a general overview of the findings, for each of these five languages across the five, existing vocabulary in that mother tongue may not have directly addressed or didn't exactly represent many of these ecological challenges as they are presented in English and or Urdu. So for example, in Pashto, participants wrote about the fact that they needed to borrow Urdu words in order to explain things like climate, heat, 
cyclone. So there appeared to be somewhat of a linguistic gap there in the ability to verbalize what these terms or these phenomena actually meant. So I want you to think about this. So Pashto, one of the major spoken languages, Pashto speakers said in, in, in Pashto, they had to borrow terms from Urdu. And so you can see the layers of um, identity, if you will, that are removed at the personal level from being able to talk about certain phenomena. So if we're talking about personal connections, we have several layers of removal there as one, as one example. So in other places, there might be a single word that would elicit multiple meanings, blizzard, cyclone, hurricane, storm, tornado. There would be code mixing, and there's an assumption that's made about code mixing. Is the code mixing really understood by the two locutors? Or is a term being used without personal identity with that term? Given the fact that global warming, actions regarding ecological decisions need to be at the personal level and the local and the regional, we need to be considering the, the actual understanding of all of the speakers of that terminology if we are going to be able to act at the change level, at the dialectical level. Some words were translated. So that adds an added explanation, which actually is a very good thing, but when you are conveying information, sometimes it's very important to try to have a term that's a mutually understood term that can be used. So that became a challenge. There, there is oftentimes also the absence of any sort of explicit terminology to describe environmental phenomena. So for example, something may not exist in the Punjabi region. And so, you know, that as the, the local language evol evolved and evolves, if you don't see something every day, you don't necessarily have the exact term for it. I will give you an example from my own context. In the United States, in the middle states of the United States, people have many different types of tornadoes. So here on the East Coast, we just use the word tornado. But in the middle part of the United States, in Canada, I'm sorry, in Kansas, in Iowa, for example, there are multiple words that describe the type of tornado, what kind of funnel it is, how fast the wind is blowing, what type of, of wind velocity there is. There are specific terms. We don't use those, but they do, and they're very meaningful. So that's when we don't have um, explicit terminology, it's hard to convey that deep meaning if we want people to act and act as they, as they need to. So words that they don't exist um, tend to be borrowed from Urdu and English in, in these regional languages. And so um, when ecological disasters, ecological challenges are described, again, there's that layer of removal from the actual phenomenon. And so, you know, at least in these five languages, um, there are linguistic workarounds that have been created. And that's not a bad thing, but they use additional um, terminology in their first language. Balti speakers spoke about this in, in their essays to describe these, um, these environmental changes. So there are some other more subtle um, 
I guess, findings that we might point out here. So for example, um, the linguistic features in some of the languages might, might constrain or mask participation of agency. So if a language largely uses the passive voice, it may convey the notion that someone else is making this happen or that I as an individual don't need to be the active um, participant or the active doer. So this is a very subtle difference, but um, there are things that are conveyed that draw people in or that keep them a little bit at bay with a complacency of, okay, that's happening over there. It's not something I need to be acting on. So I want you to think about that just a little bit. So these passive grammatical constructions could obscure the meaning of the need for action in action-oriented decision-making. And so there also, we found some, some different um, translations of terminology. So um, in one region, the term greenhouse gases, which is certainly a, a, something we need to be very concerned about, may not have a point of reference. And so when you, um, if there are greenhouses where plants are grown, the idea of greenhouse gases associated with environmental actions may have a totally different, translating that term doesn't elicit the same understanding as what our term greenhouse gases does, um, is, is aimed to, um, to elicit. So again, so we, based on this extensive work that we have been doing, we think that there are two broad areas that call for further discussion and, and action. We do believe that we need to move from solely using Urdu and English dominantly to diversify messages in regional languages. And so we want to suggest that it would be very important to call on the multilingual speakers in the regions across Pakistan and other areas of the world, but specifically our context of Pakistan here, to look at this terminology to connect with the natural environment in personal ways that will help to convey important information. This lack of indigenous ecological words may lead to some of the weak understandings that are perpetuating some of the, the um, the lack of, of ability to respond in a personal way to ecological challenges. Secondly, we want us, we, we would really like to call for thinking forward with the concept of eco-linguistic planning in order to, to promote Greek, greater eco-solidarity across the country. So la languages need to be heard. Speakers of those languages, the voices of the people really need to be um, heard so that w the ideas of environmental messaging can be conveying the message messages they are intending to convey. So the participants in our study in their essays voiced the notion that they would like to have opportunities to be part of the table. They would like to be, become part of the dialogue that would involve their region's language in messaging important communications regarding these ecological challenges. They'd like to be part of the solution finding. So a few conclusions that we have um, drawn for the moment. Goals for expanded communication cannot be achieved without local populations support. Local populations really have to deeply understand these concepts and these required actions that we must have as a world population. And these understandings need to accompany the words 
or the vocabulary that's being used. The first language, the home language, the mother tongue um, from these five regions serves as a repository of accumulated knowledge for possible solutions. We need to listen to what our regional neighbors are also contributing to the conversation. We have a lot to learn about what is in the farther regions. And so by having a, 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 a level playing field of communication, we might be able to arrive at some of those important spaces. We need to tap into this knowledge while also sharing research for translation into action. And some final words, this study involved university students who are highly thoughtful, who represent a Pakistan seeking to broaden the voice of their population to include the richness of culture and cultures and languages that are spoken there. It has been such a privilege for me to be able to learn about some of those. You all know them deeply because you are there. We need to preserve those. When languages die, so do some of those cultures and the messages coming from those cultures. This can be part of a place where equity and access can hold a place in the world dialogue about important ecological challenges. And part of our critical perspective does seek to understand diversity, equity, access, inclusivity, and to draw on that as a resource for our greater understanding. With only 25 participants, of course, this research obviously is not generalizable, but the data did provide us a deep dive it provided, us, it provided us the opportunity of a snapshot that we think is worthy of expansion and further consideration. These are five languages spoken across Pakistan. There are 60 some other languages. What might they bring to us? In their essays, the participants suggested that their first languages could and should indeed be used as a point of departure to inform solutions and connect the local population with the natural environment, and I would like to say, as a voice to the world. And this present study does contribute to some of the studies uh, um, that have come before us. The notion that while language mar marginalization leads to environmental destruction, which is what is happening around the world, we think that the role of local languages and language forms can contribute to a better ecological well being than we have now. If we're seeking solutions, we, we think individuals and regions should, should seek funding. There should be multiple stakeholders that come together at the table, time and space for collaboration materials for development, goals that have those voices as part of the goals, and certainly research to support and study the results of these efforts. So Dr. Shaban and I do thank you so much for your, for your attention and your consideration of our work. And we look forward to, um, to continuing this dialogue with you as we finish up our, our paper. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rebecca. In fact, for sharing your views on the language use for ecological problems and bringing that, that sensitivity over to our students and the listeners all over the world. Thank you very much, Dr. Rebecca. You're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, dear audience, now we have the session of question answers. We are receiving some of the questions and some of the remarks are there as well. And uh, Dr. Rebecca, if I get your attention for a question which had come in, during your presentation, and that was about the role of media, uh, because uh, how can that be when the when the, it is? I'll just read the question that one of the problems is that 
the media is less attentive towards environmental crisis, especially in local languages. What could be done in this scenario when people are less educated and are monolingual? Dr. Rebecca, if you could comment on it first. Well, I will give it a stab. I would say that we all need to be much more attuned to the richness of local languages. Even if languages do not have a print form, languages are the heart at the heart of communication. And so I think really seeking out that genuine communication will bring us to a jointly held space. So maybe some of the stakeholders at that table should be media, media services. We need multiple people to be talking about this while we also hear from people who are in the regions and experiencing the disasters that, that um, are taking place in the world today. I hope I answered your question, but I do think the media needs to be brought to, to the table with us all because they're a powerful force for disseminating information and we'd like to draw on their expertise. They may never have thought of this before. Thank you and very much. Should I <laughs> add something? Yeah, please, please. I was question. about to open it up for the other keynote speakers as well. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, I think we have to also hold the media to account. What What is it that they cover? Because, for example, Dr. Chow, who's speaking tomorrow, and I did a study about the relative coverage in four newspapers, one in Malaysia, one in Singapore, one in the UK, one in the US. This is early in the pandemic. What were they covering? So much coverage of the pandemic, where even, even though at that time, almost nobody was dying, but so little coverage of things related to the sustainable development goals, like people dying of malnutrition, people dying due to lack of clean water, lack of sanitation. So little coverage on that, even though, so many more people were and even now still are dying because of that. So, and also um, Professor Fox mentioned about using the passive voice to hide who is to blame for a lot of this environmental destruction. So again, that's something we can notice. I, I'm not saying it plays out the same way in other languages as it plays out in English, but we have to understand those languages and see what uh, see how they cover the environment. Thank you so much, Professor Jacobs. And I, I just want to also emphasize the, the incredible role that, that Dr. Shaban played um, as the knower of these languages. I'm, I'm the critical discourse analysis person, but you know, it takes a team. And um, Dr. Jacobs, you mentioned about you're teaming with someone else. We need these multiple voices working together and it's such a privilege across the world to be able to do that, isn't it? For sure. Yeah, very happy to be at this conference. Thank you very I much. Well. Yeah, maybe we can have some comments for Dr. Makwania. Uh, th thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm also a media person. Uh, unfortunately, my situation is is different from uh, Dr. Jacobs and uh, Dr. Fox. I come from a developing country, uh, formerly described the third world. The placement of media in the reporting uh, curricula or in the reporting discourse in the developing country's point of view, where environmental issues and the climate change are taken as other issues, not as special issues that need the attention that they deserve in order to be reported. They are relegated to the background, only reported when a special event is taking place. So we are saying in developing countries, we have to work hard, we have to do much more in order to change our reporting policies. It has got to do with the media houses uh, or who fund them, whereby even somebody who is sent to cover 
a, a, a climate change disaster is not conversant with the may, with with the way in which uh, energy issues are reported, agricultural issues are reported. They just report anyhow. So, in as far as developing countries are concerned, we need context-specific reporters who are trained to report in, in, in sectorials. In, in different sectors with the language of that those sectors, not just to report anyhow. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Um, about uh, Dr. Jacob, uh, one question about uh, SDGs. Mm -hmm. And the question is that all the speakers have given us, this is the acknowledgement from the students, uh, in fact, that all the speakers have given us much food for the thought. However, how do you think we can channelize this discussion among our students, faculty and students? Dr. Jacob, please, to uh, begin with. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad to see the interest in the sustainable development goals. And I'm very big on participation. So way back, I think 1977, the United Nations uh, had an environmental education organization that came up with six objectives. But number six, and I think the most important one, is that students and others actively participate in actually doing something to help the environment. Yes, awareness is very good. Understanding, very good. But they don't mean anything. They're not going to help anybody unless they're unless it's about participation. So for example, maybe 10 plus years ago, along with some colleagues from Indonesia, we got together, we made a book, we called it Triple E, uh, English Through Environmental Education. So each, there was a big team, about 12 of us, and each person did one lesson plan to teach English to the non-majors at Indonesian universities. And each lesson had some kind of participation in helping promote the environment. Now, of course, every country, every region is going to be different in terms of what kind of participation is important in that area. So yeah, we got to know the area, we've got to talk to people, environmental organizations, um, everyday people, find out about their lives, what's going on with the environment, how they can be involved, and then see what we can do to help that. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, another question from uh, Noshin, uh, that the local languages come up with limitations. Different linguistic contrasts cause a great difference on the language usages. What are some of the ways to overcome this? Um, I leave it open for the speakers. Dr. Rebecca, to begin with. Sure, I do think that some focused forums for discussion where drilling down to some of the nitty gritty challenges and asking the voices, the regional voices, their thoughts. We need to know what has worked and what isn't working and why. And so I think when we when we move from fora such as this one to action planning, we need to have people at the table, but we, as, as Dr. Jacobs had just said, we need to have many voices planning. And as Dr. Makwanya said, we have to have the media with us. So that planning piece is key at an organic level. It does need to begin there. So if, if having visits to local regions um, with people who have goals and objectives, but are there to listen first, I think we might be able to come up with some plans that could then be broadened and expanded. Uh, Dr. Jacob, to add something to this? Well, I think that uh, 
what Dr. Uh, Mukwanya said about education, I, and uh, Professor Fox seconded that. I I also think that's great because there's it's complicated. All these issues are complicated that we hear so many different solutions and people disagree. So there's uh, there's a lot of understanding that's needed at, to choose participation that will really make a positive difference. And so, and as Professor Fox said, we need it, we need the understanding to be grounded in the different communities. And that's where we need to work with the people in those communities. And as part of that, their vocabulary in the in environment can expand. They can, and that's what I think uh, Dr. Shaban was trying to do, you know, in that study they did with Dr. Fox, there's different, the, uh, not all the languages had maybe all the terms that they needed. And as Dr., as Professor Fox pointed out with tornado, there's going to be, depending on the situation, different vocabulary. So it's a learning because language is ever changing. And as we enter what's called the Anthropocene, the, the uh, geological epoch where humans are the key force changing the environment, we need vocabulary for the anth Anthropocene. And we want to have that vocabulary in as many languages as possible. Very true. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, uh, Dr. Makwania, for your last comment, because the session is almost uh, over, and um, but still we are looking for your concluding comment on this. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, let me I continue to to make reference uh, to where I come from, to where I am based, where English is the ma uh, main language of communication of judiciary, administration, legislature, in such a manner that local languages are, are silently dying. They have not been given much space, maybe they lack funding. But uh, we always have one newspaper in vernacular or in local languages once per week. How best can we improve uh, the people's vocabulary or the people's understanding of climate change issues when uh, uh, climate change is written or there is a paper without even climate change written in their own language once a week. If fun funding was available, it would have been in the best, best interest of many to have actually a paper that is published daily in, 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 in local languages but we don't have that. So uh, we continue to relegate the indigenous languages. What, what about, just, I'm just curious, what about the uh, social media? Is that widely used? Could that be a substitute? Social media is widely used, but in English. Oh, I see. Not, not in vernacular, yes. In English, yes, very much widely used. Thank you very much, sir. We conclude this question answer session, which has really made us think about the and consider the philosophy of less and more developed and underdeveloped languages all over the world, and uh, then uh, the sensitivity towards Mother Earth. Thank you very much, uh, speakers, and all those who asked these questions. We are grateful. Can I just say one last thing? I, yeah. I want to say we're so lucky to have you as the chair of the session. You're so friendly. You do the job so well. You make, you have such a warm feeling. Uh, you, I've been in many conferences. You're the best. You're very generous. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, 
to conclude the inaugural session of the conference, I request our worthy conference chair and Dean Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities, Rifa International University, Dr. Atiku Zafar Khan for his closing remarks. Dr. Khan holds a doctorate degree in economics from Islamic International University, Islamabad, with his MS degree from Waterloo University, Canada. He is an active researcher who has published several book chapters and internationally acclaimed research articles. He has the experience of utilizing qualitative research skills in a variety of economics related disciplines, including econometrics, monetary economics, development studies, and Islamic banking and finance. Dr. Khan, for his concluding remarks, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shaban and Dr. Samina Nadeem uh, and your team for uh, organizing such a uh, important conference on a subject which is uh, normally not known uh, in our society in Pakistan mostly. Uh, I hope that this conference will create awareness uh, regarding ecological issues uh, in Pakistan, which is uh, very much serious as uh, a study uh, referred by Dr. Shaban, that uh, we are facing many serious issues, ecological issues. This uh, inaugural session, uh, we benefit, benefited from the very valuable thoughts of Dr. Anis Ahmad, Vice Chancellor of Rifa International University, Dr. George M. Jacob, and uh, Dr. Peter McVania and Dr. Rebecca. Uh, these all uh, established scholars uh, benefited us uh, from their thoughts. Uh, Dr. Anis Ahmad uh, pointed out uh, the importance of uh, religious uh, guidelines which are available by the words of God, word of God uh, in Quran, especially the verses which were selected in the recit for the recitation in the beginning. Uh, the God has said in the Quran that I have put everything in balance and asked not to disturb this balance. Wala tukhsarul mizan, don't disturb the balance. So it means that all natural resources are given in such a good proportion that they should interact uh, quite successfully with each other and uh, you can say uh, substantiate and support each other for survival of life at this universe. But it is very unfortunate that uh, in uh, present world, a nation or society which acquire the ability to destroy the world more and create more and more uh, ecological and environmental problem, that society is considered as superpower in this world. Actually, it should be opposite that a society which is more beneficial, more supportive to life, on this uh, world should be considered as the superpower, but our scales are very different and opposite. Uh, Dr. George has given uh, the broader concept of the education that in education, we should not teach only the mechanics and terminologies, but we also add values and teach the purpose of life to the students, other only then we will be teaching. Otherwise, we, we will be cheating our students. Uh, very interesting phrases uh, in, 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 were introduced by Dr. George in his uh, presentation. Dr. Uh, Peter McVania also uh, emphasized that we cannot teach uh, many sciences without using nature as a laboratory, that uh, biology or physics or chemistry or any discipline can be understood only when students are given chance to interact with the nature in reality. And Dr. Rebecca uh, 
presented the findings of a study that how local languages are important for the preservation of the culture and nature in different societies. So these all presentations were very useful, very valuable for the audience. I hope that this conference will go a long way in creating awareness on environmental and ecological issues in different societies. And uh, we hope that uh, in coming sessions of the conference, we will listen uh, more scholars and benefit from their work and their academic contributions. I would like to thank the organizers, the speakers, and the participants who are attending the conference in the large number. And uh, at the end, I would like to thank you all for making this session very successful. May Allah bless you all. Thank you very much, sir. We are grateful for your concluding remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, and our dear students, with this, we conclude our inaugural session of the conference. Just as a reminder, our first session tomorrow morning will begin at 9.30 Pakistan Standard Time. Hoping to see you all there. Jazakallah khaira kaseera. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.